Yeah, very interesting. How do you create a beginning and an end? And particularly in science, because in a sense there is no beginning and no end, because with science it's always coming from somewhere and it's always been passed on like a baton. And I described this book as a relay race of stories. So I was looking, I started off, I felt that there was a, some kind of dark hole between the death of Isaac Newton, which is I think 1724, and Charles Darwin getting on the Beagle to go to the Galapagos, which is 1831. Somewhere around there, I felt there was no history of, of particularly British science. Um, so in the end, I tightened this down to focus, which is almost exactly the same as the traditional focus for romantic literature. And it begins, the actual book begins with a voyage and it ends with a voyage. And it begins with the voyage, the first voyage of Captain James Cook, Lieutenant James Cook as he was then, who set out on the Endeavour ship in 1768. And that was the first great, it was going to be a round the, round the world trip and going through the Pacific and uh, landing in Australia and very particularly landing in Tahiti. And with him, he took one of the earliest real scientific teams, headed by a very interesting man who runs right through the book, called Joseph Banks. So that's the beginning of the book. And as it were, two generations later, we come to young Charles Darwin, who appears at the end of the book, a chapter called Young Scientist. And he's preparing at Cambridge, and suddenly gets this amazing chance to go on the ship, the Beagle, to the Galapagos. So that's those two journeys, and I play with that idea because I say the kind of science I'm describing, the metaphor of the perilous journey, very much runs right through it in whichever discipline you're talking about. So there you are, those are the two bookends. That Two Cultures lecture was delivered 1959, 100 years after 1859, The Origin of Species, and we've suffered, I think, from that lecture, given at Cambridge, uh, this idea that the people who study arts and humanities cannot understand or speak to people who work in the sciences. Um, and I, um, I suppose I, um, it goes a long way back with me, but since uh, Snow gave that lecture at Cambridge, I also went to Cambridge, and I went, although I went to read history in English, by amazing good luck, I was taken on by the new science college, Churchill, founded by Winston Churchill. 70% uh, of the students and postgraduates there are scientists. All my friends were scientists. So as it were, I was studying Milton, but I was taken to look through the telescopes of the big observatory up there, or told how to strip down a motorcycle, or describe what was happening in nuclear physics. So I had, right from the beginning, that amazing mix. And I feel one of the themes of the book is very much, although it's a study of a period when people of science, they weren't actually called scientists then, were talking and had great friendships with people in the arts and writers. The model of this being the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge and the great, his great friendship with the young chemist here in Bristol, Humphrey Davy. And from that, that friendship, I go out and I look at, in the various disciplines, how they were talking to each other. And I think the, kind of one of the messages of the book is this is beginning to happen again now and it's very, very important that we do that. The book is called The Age of Wonder and people ask me, is The Age of Wonder still with us? And I say yes, very much so. And I think very particularly so. We are in a great age of, for example, science popularising. Wonderful books about science are being written now for general readership. And I think they're one of the that key notions is the, the idea of the wonders, of the physical wonders of the universe that science can open up. But also, and of course this is the subtitle of the book, uh, The Beauty and Terror of Science. And right the way through the book there is this play, and I think it's something we've had to grow up with now. Science is the great source of hope for us, and you can say in a planetary way, but also it's the sense, it's a source of fear and distrust. And you have to learn to live with those two sides. And the book is very much about that. And part of my argument is this kind of debate began in the Romantic period. It wasn't a Victorian phenomenon. It was already there in the Romantic period. The first thing I thought was, oh, what a wonderful idea, a festival, a Bristol festival of ideas anyway. And a prize for ideas, not, not purely literary thing for ideas, I think is, is a great idea itself. And the other thing I would say as a historian, I mean, in, my, in the Romantic period, Bristol always was a centre for generating 
both sort of trade but also intellectual movement and energy. And I feel very much we're here again. So it doesn't surprise me that it's Bristol that has come up with this idea. Hooray for the West of England. <laughs>